uh, 12 and 20. Uh, when we get to chapter 20, uh, it'll pretty much be a review because we already talked about accounting for um, changes and error corrections and those sort of things in an earlier chapter. So we should just be reviewing at that point. Okay, so uh, let's take a look at chapter 10 and 11 now, and we're going to work our way to discussion of property, plant, and equipment, including the depreciation of that property, plant, and equipment, and uh, we're also going to spend some time talking about how to deal with uh, disposal of fixed assets and also uh, intangible assets as well. And we'll finish up uh, towards the end with a discussion of impairment of fixed assets. If you already print, printed the slides, guys, you may want to uh, take a look for next time at the last few slides that we'll probably have to look at next time because I have added a few more towards the end. As far as um, quiz questions, there's two files for quizzes, okay, so you should probably start looking at those over the weekend so when we're looking at those on Monday you've uh, got a little bit of practice with some of those and you've had a chance to look at some of those so you get the most out of uh, that discussion on Monday when we're looking at the quiz questions if we get to some of them today that's fine as well uh, we'll see how the time goes because we do have uh, quite a few slides to look at here okay so let's just go ahead and take a look at um, oh and after class um, if you didn't pick up your test on Monday, please do come up and pick up your uh, midterm. Don't do it now. Uh, do it after class because I still have a chunk of those. And, uh, you know, I'm starting to get shoulder separation from carrying around all these pieces of paper that uh, students haven't picked up. So um, pick those up after class. Okay. All right. So let's just go ahead and take a look at this subject of property, plant, and equipment. Okay. And when we're talking about property, plan, and equipment, we are obviously talking about non-current assets. Okay. And our land is essentially our property. Okay. Our buildings are our plant. And our equipment is going to be our equipment. Now, of course, going against our buildings and our equipment will be accumulated depreciation. It's a contra asset account. I know you know that well because we had our little magnet exercise up here where you all got that right. Land is what? Land is not depreciated. Okay, so we will not depreciate our land, although we will need to evaluate it for impairment and that if it's dropped in value, we'll have to take that loss. But uh, we don't depreciate land. And I've had students who've asked me, well, what if the land collapses? If there's one of them sinkholes or something? Well, if that's the case, then we'll take that loss when the sinkhole manifests itself, right? Okay, so we don't have to take that until such occurrence, all right? Oh, another thing. It came to my attention last time that people are signing in for each other. If I take a look at that attendance sheet when I get it back and I sense that the signatures do not match what my eyeballs tell me are in here, then we're going to have to start taking time out of the class with the little bit of time we have left to do a roll call. And you don't want that. So do not sign in for somebody else. If I catch that, there's a 10-point runoff on the individual who you did that to. So I guess if you have an enemy that you want to try to destroy, go down that path. Okay, but we'll see how that goes. Okay, all right. Now, what happens? We carry our fixed assets at historical cost. Carry it at historical cost. So that's basically what we have paid for it. But, of course, we'll subtract any accumulated depreciation. And, of course, if there's impairment, we'll subtract that. Now, if there is a donated fixed asset, we bring it in at the fair value at the date of donation and we don't credit cash or accounts payable like any, anything like that because it's being given to us, but we will recognize a gain on the donation of this land, whatever it is. In the rare occurrence that something like that happened. Shouldn't happen very much, okay? But again, when we're carrying our fixed assets, we're carrying them using the cost model. Cost model is going to be whatever the historical cost was, 
Okay, our carrying value under the cost model is going to be wherever the historical, co historical cost was minus the accumulated depreciation. And we'll talk about, towards the end, minus any impairment. Again, you have to evaluate your assets for impairment. If there is impairment, you have to reduce the carrying value of that asset by any impairment. Okay, we're going to be taking a look at the elements here, what constitutes the historical cost, what depreciation we'll be taking, and as I said, we'll talk about impairment uh, towards the end, cost model. Okay, now, cost of land. Now, why is it important that we are able to separate the cost of land from the cost of, say, a building that we're putting on the land? Why would that be very important for the accountant to be able to do that? Huh? Say what? We want to allocate it correctly between the land and the building, but why is the allocation between the land and the building very important? Well, the building can burn down. You're on the right. Well, the building absolutely will depreciate, right? Whereas the land will not, right? Okay, so we need to be able to distinguish between the cost associated with the land and the cost associated with the building. Now, obviously, the cost associated with the land is going to be the purchase price, but take a look at all these other things, guys, and if you're sitting here and you're kind of really shocked by any of these, I'd put these down on a flashcard or something like that, uh, particularly these last couple of ones, okay? Um, but obviously the purchase price, any brokerage commissions that we've had to pay, any title and recording fees, legal fees, draining of swamps, Clearing of brushes and trees, okay? Now, you look at these and you're like, so we have to memorize that list. Well, you can think about it this way. Any cost that you incur to secure that land into your ownership and get it ready for its intended use is part of the cost of the land. So if you're going to put a building on that piece of land, you've got to clear off the brush, drain the swamps, that kind of thing, right? Okay, so think about it that way. But then you take a look at these last couple of ones and you see that any cost of tearing down any buildings that are existing on the land, I guess you could throw that in with cost to get it ready for its intended use. you got to tear down an old building. But then what? Then some junk dealer comes along and says, hey, I'll pay you $10,000 for that twisted metal there. Okay, then that can be subtracted off of the what? Off of the total cost because you recovered those costs, right? Okay, that's all considered cost of land. Okay, now when we get to the cost of the plant now, the building, we're going to have the purchase price. This is an important one. If there were repairs that were neglected by the previous owners, that's part of the cost of the building. So what happens? You go in there and you want to buy the piece of land, I mean the uh, building, I should say, the plant, and there's all kinds of dry rot. And you can't even walk into that building without it falling down, right? Well, that cost that you're going to have to spend to get it structurally sound because the previous owner neglected the maintenance is part of the cost, the original cost of that building, okay? Architectural fees, et cetera, okay? And we'll talk about construction period interest here in a little while. If you have to borrow the money to construct an asset, we're going to see how we're going to do that. Okay, so we have seen elements that go into the cost of the land, the cost of the building, right? Okay, but what happens if they give me a, they, I, I buy a piece of land and I pay, say, $500,000 for that land? Ugh, I hate this thing. I pay $500,000 for that land. And the land has a building on it. So I've got building what? Plus land here, don't I? How much of that 500000 should go towards the building? How much of that 500000 should go towards the land? They call this a basket purchase. Okay. Well, what companies do is they would have an appraiser come in and they would have an appraiser appraise the land as though that building was not sitting on it. 
and then appraise the building as though it was not on that particular piece of land. And so you're going to get some different values, right? I mean, if you have a building that's perfect for a restaurant in a restaurant district, that's going to cost you a lot more than a building that's perfect for a restaurant in a car dealership district where you're planning to put a car dealership later, right? Okay. So they come in and they appraise those separately. And let's say the appraised value of the land is 100000 the appraised value of the building is 300000 Well, separately, they end up with a total of what? 400000 You're like, well, why would I pay 500000 Because maybe it's a restaurant in a restaurant district, right? So you got to pay a little more for that, okay? So what they would do is take the 100000 divided by 400000 or what? 25% of that total purchase price is going to go towards the land. So I take the 500,000, what's that, 125,000 that's going towards the land here? Okay. And then, of course, you can probably figure out where this is going now. The 300,000 that is attributed to the building of the total 400,000, or what? Obviously, 75% times the 500,000 means that, what, uh, 375,000 is going to be land? Okay. Pretty easy, kind of fun, right? I have no idea what you asked, but if that satisfies you, you're good. Okay. Okay, good. Now you come over, and uh, that's it. Nothing else. Okay. That's all there is to that. Very easy. Okay. Now you come over, and we talk about cost of equipment. Cost of equipment. Any cost that you incurred to secure that equipment so that you can use it productively in your business is part of the cost of that equipment. So what? Delivery charges are part of the cost of equipment. Obviously, the invoice price is part of the cost of that equipment. Insurance that you pay in transit for that, right? Because you got to pay that to get it successfully to your business so you can use it. Any cost that you incur to fix it properly so you can use it in your business. If you have to knock out a wall to fit that thing into your business, that's part of the cost of the what? Equipment, right? Okay, so we come down and you can see the different things. Of course, if there's any discounts, you'd subtract those. The freight in, including insurance, okay, installation charges, uh, excise tax. I had a student that called me years ago and said, John, we just bought a bunch of computers. And everybody is saying that we have to expense the fee that they charge you for the computers. There's that disposal fee. Everyone's saying it's expense. We should capitalize that, right? And I'm like, that's correct. That is part of the cost of securing the asset. It is going to be part of the cost of the asset. And I have no idea why the company wanted to expense that because it's going to make their net income look smaller, isn't it? It's better to capitalize it and then depreciate, isn't it? But I'm not sure what happened there. But uh, I think she lost the argument because she got fired soon after that. So I don't know. She probably should have let it go. Okay. All right. So anyway, that's all right. She found another job. She didn't need to be at that company. Okay. All right. So let's just go ahead then and take a look at retirement of the plan assets. So we bring them on the books. We debit cash. We, cr I mean, we credit the cash. We debit the equipment. As we depreciate that, we debit the depreciation expense. We credit the accumulated depreciation, right? Later on, we sell that, we're going to have to do what? Credit the equipment, debit the accumulated depreciation, bring in any potential cash proceeds. Difference is going to be the gain or loss that we'll recognize. Okay, so just a couple of uh, examples here. If we purchase some equipment for 32000 and it was completely depreciated, there's no gain or loss. We just dispose of it, we don't bring any cash in at all, right? Okay, so you just take out the accumulated depreciation, take out the equipment, okay? Now, you come over, and if we have, what, uh, equipment that costs 18000 accumulated depreciation is 14000 then we will go ahead and take the loss because, what, we hadn't completely depreciated that asset. We still had assumed that we had $4,000 of future economic benefit, which we are now writing off. We will debit the loss, right? Okay. Okay, good. I was watching something the other day where some guy was giving another guy a hard time because he said, oh, the companies just write that off. And the guy was telling him, you don't know what write that off means. And I'm like, sitting there, well, I know what it means. Okay. Writing it off, meaning they're going to take it off the books, right? 
and they're going to take the loss for that at that point in time. Now, you come over, and what happens if we actually sell the asset for cash? If we sell it for more than its book value, that's going to be a gain. If we sell it for less than its book value, that is a loss. Good. What is book value? Book value is cost minus the accumulated depreciation, right? Okay. Okay, good. So we have these facts here, the cost, the accumulated depreciation, the book value we know is 11000 and they sell it for what? 16000 So there's a $5,000 gain because they sold it for more than its book value, right? So we would just go ahead and debit the cash. That's a piece of cake. Debit the accumulated depreciation to get rid of that. Credit the equipment. That's a 60000 My zero spilled over there. And then the gain is the difference between the cash and the book value, right? Okay. Um, where does this gain get reported? Okay, it is not other comprehensive income. It is part of my net income. I would have revenue minus expenses as operating income. Then I have my non-operating items, and that's going to give me then my net income, right? Other comprehensive income, guys, is stuff like the pension adjustment, unrealized holding gains and losses, effective pet portion of cash flow hedge, and foreign currency translation items, right? Those are the... Uh, other comprehensive income items. You take your net income plus your other comprehensive income, and that is comprehensive income. Remember I told you you're supposed to walk in the house and say that to everybody every day so they fear you? You just walk in and you say, my what? My other comprehensive income items plus my income items give me comprehensive income. And they'll leave you alone. Okay? All right. Now, you take a look at this one and now they're selling it for nine thousand they're selling it for less than book value so that is a loss right and so i would just go ahead and debit the loss there and the rest of that journal entry is exactly the same there's no gain now and i just take the equipment off and the accumulated depreciation right and that loss is non-operating okay Okay, good. Come over, but it's part of my calculation of net income. It's not part of my other comprehensive income. It is part of my comprehensive income, right? Because comprehensive income is net income plus other comprehensive income, right? Okay. All right. Now, you come over, and we start talking about making improvements uh, and replacements of our fixed assets. Now, if we add a wing to the building, that's easy enough. We're going to do what? Debit the asset, whatever it is, building, machinery, credit the cash accounts payable for whatever we paid for that addition, right? Okay, we'll just capitalize that, okay? But what happens if we have a replacement and we replace a new similar asset that is substituted for an old asset, okay? And we say if the carrying value of the old asset is known, simply remove the value of the old asset like we just did recognize the gain or loss, like I just showed you on the previous slides, right? And then bring the new asset on the books. Piece of cake, right? Okay. Now, you come over to the next slide and they say, well, what if the carrying value of the old asset is unknown? Now, you stop there for a second. You say, what, we got some bad accounting? Why would we not know the carrying value of the asset? Well, what they're talking about here is a potential situation where you bought a building, and when you bought the building, the roof was up there, wasn't it? Now you got to replace the roof. Do you know the carrying value of the roof? No, when you bought the building, you paid $100,000 for the whole building. The roof came with it, didn't it? So you wouldn't know the carrying value of the roof, yet you are replacing it, aren't you? Okay, so what would you do? If you're in a situation where the asset life, where the value of the asset is, the usefulness of the asset is increased, increased. I'm going to do that one first. I'll come back to that other one. If the value of the asset is increased, simply debit what? Debit the asset account, whatever the asset is, the fixed asset is, and credit your cash for whatever you paid for that roof replacement, right? Thus, you're bringing up the book value of the asset by doing that, okay? If you've extended 
the life of the asset, then make this journal entry. Instead of debiting the equipment account, whatever, you would debit a building account. You would debit accumulated depreciation and credit cash. When you do that, does the carrying value of the asset come up? Either way, the carrying value of the asset comes up, doesn't it? It's just how you have categorized that increase on your balance sheet. Have you put it in the asset account or have you reduced the accumulated appreciation account, right? Question? Um, yeah, you know. Well, you know. I don't know that that's something that has to be disclosed every time you do something like that. I suppose if it was significantly material, you might want to disclose that, that we replaced. But, you know, if it's something that you just replaced a roof and you chose to debit the accumulated depreciation, I don't think that needs to be disclosed. You know, you can start to get to a point where the disclosure in your footnote starts to overwhelm. And then we have violated our, what, secondary qualitative characteristic of understandability. So I think we've got to be careful in how much stuff we start piling into those notes. Every time we change the uh, roof on a building, that could get a little tedious for the, for the users. Okay. okay, good. Now, if it's a repair, if it's an ordinary repair, that is expensed. Okay, That is something that when I was looking at the homework questions, I saw that was a common thing eh, that they tried to trick us on. So be careful with that. If we are sitting here and we are basically dealing with an ordinary repair that should be expensed and now I got the right highlighter but the wrong color because you can't read through that green but at least now I remember to tell somebody to remind me to remember to tell me to save this file and we're done okay all right but what happens ordinary repairs are expensed so if you do a tune-up on your delivery truck you don't capitalize that that is what that's expense right you do a brake job that's going to what? That's going to be expensed. If you overhaul the engine, you take the old engine out and you put a new engine in, that is what? An extraordinary repair. That should be what? That should be capitalized. Okay? And so you would debit the asset account, credit the cash, or what? Debit the accumulated depreciation and credit the cash. Okay? Yes, sir. Do you want me to go over leasehold improvements? Yeah, just briefly. I'll, I know it's just going to happen next week, but yeah. I'm just going to leasehold Well, if it's a leasehold improvement, it would have the effect of both of those, okay, which is typically taught in the section in the textbook where we talk about leases, so we talk about that more in intermediate two, okay, but yes, just briefly. If I have a leasehold improvement, I would go ahead and I would capitalize the lease. So let's say capitalize that asset, the improvement. So let's say I'm going to change all the lights in the building, but I'm just leasing the building. I would sit there and debit the asset building, credit cash for the lights, whatever, right? And I put that in the property plan equipment section, okay? Now I have to depreciate it. And I would depreciate it over the shorter of the useful life of that asset or the... Uh, term of the lease, whatever is shorter, because if the term of the lease was, say, eight years, even though the, light, the lights might last 10 years, I'm gone. So I amortize it over the term of the lease in that case. If the term of the lease was, um, you know, 10 years, but the lights only had an eight-year life, now I'm going to do what? I'm going to depreciate over the life of the lights because they're going to need to be replaced before I get out of that lease, right? Okay, but that's uh, going to cover more in the lease section, unless you guys want me to include it on this midterm. No, you don't want to. Okay. Does that answer your question? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay, good. Now, we come over and um, we talk about um, capitalization of interest costs. Okay. What happens if we have to borrow money to construct an asset. Let's say we're going to build a building and we have to borrow the money to build that building. GAAP requires that we capitalize the interest costs associated with that because, again, think about the big picture. That is part of the cost of acquiring that asset, isn't it? Okay. So when we go ahead and we do that, we should capitalize cost 
And when we capitalize those costs, I'm going to switch back to yellow. When we capitalize those costs, we will capitalize that using the weighted average of accumulated expenditures. Now, I'm going to show you how to calculate the weighted average of accumulated expenditures here in a couple of minutes, okay? But we'll have this number called weighted average of accumulated expenditures. And we will apply an interest rate to the average amount of the accumulated expenditures, the weighted average of accumulated expenditures. So you say, okay, well, what's the interest rate? The interest rate is going to be the interest rate paid on the borrowing specifically for the asset. Okay, so the problem may say you borrowed this much to construct that asset and the interest rate on that debt was X percent, whatever it was, that will be the interest rate on that specific borrowing. Okay. Now, you come over and you take a look at the next slide here. If we have an amount that is in excess of the specific borrowing related to that borrowing for the construction of that asset, then we will have to take that excess and apply an interest rate that is the average interest rate of all the other borrowings of the company. Okay, so we'll look at to see what all our other borrowings were, and that is the interest rate that we will use to apply to that excess of the amount that was in excess of the specific amount for that borrowing. Okay, now you come over and a couple of rules here. We may not exceed our actual interest costs. The amount that we capitalize cannot exceed our actual interest costs for the period. Okay, so we're going to have a cap on what we can capitalize. We cannot exceed our actual interest costs. Okay? We also do not reduce our capitalized interest if we have had some opportunity to invest some idle funds that we borrowed for this construction and that earned interest. We're not allowed to reduce the amount we capitalized by the interest that might have been earned on any excess amounts that were available before we began construction. Okay? Now, a couple of key rules then. Only capitalized interest on the money actually spent, not the amount borrowed. The amount of capitalized interest is the lower of the actual interest or the computed capitalized interest, avoidable interest. That's that amount that we get by applying an interest rate to the weighted average of accumulated expenditures. Okay. Now, you look at all that and you think, okay, no way. I don't understand any of that. Look at this question, in this example, and you're going to see that it's pretty easy. Okay, So we've got this company that signed a fixed price contract to have a, con a contract built for a million dollars. On the same day, they borrowed 500000 to finance the construction. The loan is payable in five 100000 annual payments plus interest at 11%. They plan to finance the balance of the construction during the company's ex using company's existing debt that had a weighted average interest rate of 9%. And then they tell me that during the year, the weighted average of cumulative expenditures were 600000 and actual interest was 150000 Now, how are we going to handle all that? First off, we know that we apply the interest rate to the amount of the specific new borrowing, don't we? Okay. So we had what? We had weighted average of accumulated expenditures of 600000 didn't we? Okay, but that weighted average of accumulated expenditures is in excess of the amount of the actual borrowing, isn't it? Damn. So we are capped at what? 500000 Okay, our weighted average of accumulated expenditures is 600000 but that borrowing specific was what? 500000 and the interest rate on that was 11%, so we take that part, right? Then for the amount of weighted average of accumulated expenditures that are in excess of the specific borrowing, that was what? This additional 100000 600000 minus 500000 They told us we should use the what? Average interest rate of all of our borrowings of the company, which is what? 9%. So the amount that we're thinking we should capitalize is what? 64000 Okay. Now, you look at that and you say, well, can I capitalize all of that? And less, yes, you can because your actual interest cost for the period was what? 150000 wasn't it? 
okay so those are the rules there if you're going to borrow money to construct an asset whatever you do what you gotta pick out the weighted average of accumulated expenditures don't you you're going to capitalize up to that amount on the specific borrowing. If there's amounts weighted average of accumulated expenditure that are in excess of that, then you have to use the average borrow, the average interest rate of all other borrowings of the company. And you're capped out at what? Your actual interest cost. Okay. Now, the amount that you capitalize begins when these three conditions are present. Okay, so expenditures have been made for the asset, activities necessary to get the asset ready for its intended use are in progress, interest costs are actually being uh, incurred, and you continue as long as those three elements are present. You would stop capitalizing if these three elements are not present, um, so it stops during what? Intentional delays in construction why would we intentionally delay construction um yeah I guess we could be short on funds we really shouldn't be if we're sitting here and borrowing the money to do that so that becomes a whole nother thing what I'm thinking is let's say we're building condos and the condo market goes Woo! well we would be kind of silly to continue building condos and now we're very doubtful about whether or not we're gonna be able to sell them so we kind of want to wait and see if things are gonna improve that's an intentional delay, right? You can continue to capitalize the interest during, during ordinary delays, which you're looking out the window right now as an example of an ordinary delay in construction. You can't build a building while it's raining, can you? Okay, so you would uh, have an ordinary delay. You could continue to capitalize the interest, okay? Okay, and once you get the asset ready for its intended use, then you do not continue to capitalize interest. So go back to the condo example. I build the condos. So now I'm just trying to sell them, right? Can I continue to capitalize that interest while I'm trying to sell them? No. It has to be what? Construction is going on. Now when I say construction, because sometimes students get confused, they think they mean that, you know, it's got to be a guy's out there hammering. No, it could be building the, you know, drawing the blueprints, getting the permits that we need to build, all of those sort of things have to be going on. But if now we're done with construction and we're just sitting waiting for somebody to come buy the asset that we constructed, we stop capitalizing the interest onto that, right? And it starts to become interest expense. Okay. Okay, now the question becomes then, how do I calculate the weighted average of accumulated expenditures? Okay, and so if you take a look at this example we have what we have this mills company and um, they're sitting up here and um, they're going to construct this uh, office building and they tell us the expenditures here that they make during the year so they make five hundred thousand at the beginning of the year they spend a little bit more on march 31st they spend a little bit more on, I mean, on, uh, yeah, March 31st, a little bit more on September 30th, okay? And so we look and we have what? We have uh, accumulated expenditures at 2018 or 1.5, and then they go on with some more expenditures in 2019, okay? So on January 1st, the company obtained a million dollar construction loan with 8% interest. The loan was outstanding during the entire construction period. The company's other interest-bearing debt included two long-term notes of $2 million and $4 million with interest rates of 6 and 12% respectively. Both notes were outstanding during the entire construction period, blah, blah. Okay. Now, let's just take a look, and the key takeaway here, guys, is how to calculate the weighted average of accumulated expenditures. Okay. So what happens? The January 1st money was outstanding the entire year, wasn't it? Okay, because it was outstanding already in January. Okay, just doing the 2018. The what? March 31st money was what? Outstanding for 9 twelfths of the year. All of April, all of May, all of June, all of July, all of August, all of September, all of October, all of November, all of December. Is nine months. Okay. And then we got to September 30th and what? That's three months, October, November, December. So we weight them appro appropriately, weighted average of accumulated expenditures then is $950 here. Okay. And so then what? Since we had that $950 
and we had nine hundred fifty thousand dollars, and we had borrowed what? We had borrowed one million. Then we can use that eight percent for that what? For that entire nine hundred fifty thousand. Okay, and so that's what they did down here, and so the capitalizable interest is seventy six thousand, but we got to check it against our cap. And our actual interest expenses were what? Way more than that $76,000, were not they? Okay, so we're okay capitalizing that entire $76,000. Okay. $76,000 is less than, I mean, if you just look at the loan. So it's got to, you can't capitalize more than the actual interest expenditures for the period. And if you just look at this one loan, a million times 8% would have been what? Uh, 80000 Okay, so as long as we, we can't capitalize more than our actual interest expense, the 76000 is less than the 80000 isn't it? If this number was bigger than 80000 well, I shouldn't say bigger than 80000 because they also had interest expense on these other two that I don't feel like cal calculating the interest on them. Okay, but I know just looking at that one loan, 76000 is what? Less than the 80000 right? So I can capitalize all of that interest. Okay. Okay. Oh, here we go. This is where they calculate... Um, the um, the additional amounts, the 600000 on those additional amounts. Okay, and again, we're under that cap, so we're fine. Okay. Okay, good. Let's talk about depreciation. And I've got this little picture of the railroads up here because prior to the construction of the railroads in the United States, companies did not depreciate their assets. In fact, they didn't even record the assets. They simply did what? They simply expensed everything that they were spending. Well, they realize when they're spending all this money building this tremendous future economic benefit across the country, I guess if you if you weren't, as long as you weren't a Native American, I guess it was a future economic benefit. For the Native Americans, it was the end of their lifestyle. But what? You put this railroad across the country as its future economic benefit, you're treating everything as an expense. So it was around that time that they decided, hey, we should capitalize the cost of our assets, right? Okay, and those assets then did what? Start to constitute our property, plant, and equipment. Of course, not all assets long-term are property, plan, equipment. A long-term investment would also obviously be long-term. Okay, this is not sleepy time. This is your chosen profession. So you don't sleep through intermediate accounting. Save it for economics or something because anything they're saying in there is not going to be useful to you. Okay, all right. Now you come over and you take a look at the depreciation methods. Okay, and when we look at depreciation, we of course are going to consider the cost, the useful life of the asset, the salvage value of the asset, right? Okay, and I'm waking you up because I'm going to go kind of quick through this because I assume you know this already. Okay, this is very simple stuff. We're going to talk about straight line units of activity, declining balance. We'll talk about some of years digits even though it's not called out on this slide. Okay, so when you buy a truck, you debit the equipment, you credit the cash for $13,000. Truck has a $1,000 salvage life, $1,000 salvage value, five-year life, 100000 estimated useful life in miles. Okay, most companies will use straight line because it's the easiest. It's going to turn out that units of production is the most accurate method because it's based on how much we use that asset, right? But you've got to keep up the records of how much you use that asset. And some companies don't want to go through that additional expense, so they just use straight line. Okay? Double declining balance is essentially trying to approximate what the units of production method would use, as does some of yours digits, okay? even though they don't have that listed here. Okay, So 13000 minus minus $1,000 salvage value gives me a depreciable cost of 12000 I divide that by the five-year useful life. I've got depreciation expense of $2,400 a year, right? Okay. And so each year I debit the depreciation expense. I credit the accumulated depreciation $2,400, don't I? Okay. And you've known that for a long, long time. Now, sometimes my students will argue with me is how is a five-year life 20%? One divided by five is... 20%. So we're taking 20% a year and we're taking that off of the depreciable cost. 
Each year, we report 2400 of depreciation on the income statement. And our what accumulated depreciation goes up each year on the balance sheet, doesn't it? Okay, as we depreciate that asset. Eventually, notice the asset's carrying value is the salvage value, isn't it? Okay, now you come over and we talked about footnotes. We do put in our footnotes that depreciation is an estimate, don't we? Okay, so that's a requirement as a uh, general um, uh, risk footnote. We have uncertainty and risk footnote that we're required to put in our financial statements. And in there, we talk about the use of estimates. And we don't necessarily call it out as depreciation, but there's a use of estimates. And the results could differ. Okay. Okay, good. Now, if we sell the asset, and we've already talked about this, and we sell it for... $1,000, we don't take any gain or loss, right? If we sell it for more than the book value, then we will go ahead and take the gain for that. If we sell it for less than the book value, we will take the loss on that. And again, that's reported on the income statement. Okay. Okay, good. Um, that is our straight line. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on straight line, okay? I'm not going to spend a lot of time on any of this. We're going to fly through this, okay? What happens? If we use units of production, we still have the depreciable base. We subtract off the $1,000 salvage value from the cost, but now instead of dividing it by the years, we divide it by the miles. That gives me an amount per mile, doesn't it? Then I take that amount per mile and I simply multiply it by the number of miles I drove that truck or the number of widgets that came out of that machine or whatever it is, right? And that gives me my depreciation. So obviously, I'm getting a much more accurate calling out of what my depreciation expense is each year, reporting my depreciation expense, because I'm basing it on use, right? The more you use an asset, the faster it depreciates. The problem, you say, well, why doesn't everybody use units of production then? The problem is I've got to keep track of the mileage, don't I? You say, well, that's only one vehicle, John, big deal. Well, what if I'm FedEx? I've got planes, I've got trucks, I've got little vans, blah, 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 blah. It could start to get a little bit difficult. Okay, now I'm thinking that a good app would be what? Something that wires, wirelessly transmits whatever the mileage has been to what? Some sort of database that what? Feeds into our accounting system. I think that transmitting into the database is easy enough. Getting it into our accounting system, because we don't want a database of all this information, then we got to do what? Input it into our accounting system. So something that interfaces with the accounting system would be a useful app, right? And then we can get a more accurate picture of our depreciation using units of production. Okay? Now, you come over, and as I said, some companies will use something called declining balance. And what declining balance does for you is it approximates your units of production method. Okay? And what we do is we take our straight line. Remember the straight line was 20%? And if we're using double declining balance, and it doesn't have to be double in this class, it will be just to keep it a little simpler for us, but it could be triple declining balance, quadruple declining, one and a half declining balance. It doesn't have to be double, but we'll always use double. And if we're using double, we take the straight line and we simply do what? We double it, so we're going to take 40% of whatever the remaining book value is at the end of each year. Okay, so you come over to this slide and notice that for the first year, the remaining book value is 13000 isn't it? We don't subtract the accumulated depreciation. However, we will not depreciate below salvage value. Okay, so we don't use the accumulated depreciation, I mean, uh, excuse me, the, yeah, the salvage value, excuse me, in the calculation, but we're aware of it because we won't depreciate below our salvage value. So the first year, we just take the 13,000, 40% of that is 5,200, and so the book value is now 7,800, right? After we take that 5,200 depreciation, we take that 7,800, we multiply that by 40%, that gives me 3,120. My accumulated depreciation is now 8,320. 13,000 minus 8,320 leaves me a remaining book value 4,680. 5,200 plus 3,120 gives me accumulated depreciation of 8,320. 13,000 minus accumulated depreciation of 8,320 gives me 4,680. 4,680 times 
Forty percent gives me eighteen seventy two. Eighteen seventy two plus eight three two zero gives me ten thousand one ninety two. Thirteen thousand minus ten thousand one ninety two gives me two eight zero eight. Remaining book value two eight zero eight times forty percent gives me one one two three one one two three plus ten thousand one hundred ninety two gives me eleven thousand three hundred fifteen. Thirteen thousand minus eleven thousand three hundred fifteen gives me one six eight five. One six eight five times forty percent gives me six hundred and seventy four. Six hundred and seventy four plus eleven thousand three hundred fifteen gives me eleven thousand eight nine eight. 13,000 minus 11,898 gives me 10011. Okay, now what happens? I go through all that because in what? 2020, this is the big takeaway from all that table stuff. In 2020, what happens? I would only take $11 of depreciation because I am capped at what? A book value of $1,000. So even though I didn't use the book value, uh, I didn't use the salvage value in the calculations. I certainly considered it and calculated my depreciation in that last year, right? Okay. Okay, good. Let's look at, uh, oh, I threw away my important point here. Notice that what? The depreciation expense is a lot in the earlier years and less in the later years. When you buy an asset, do you use it a lot in the beginning or a little bit in the beginning? A lot in the beginning, and then when the thing starts getting old, oh, take that delivery truck. Don't take it too far because it's going to conk out on you. Just take it for local deliveries or something, right? And so this is sort of approximating what units of production would be doing for us without having to keep tracking the mileage and all that. Okay. Okay, good. Let's take a look at sum of years digits, okay? With sum of years digits, we take the life. This asset had a four-year life, and we add up the digits of the four years. One year, two year, three year, four year. We add that up, that comes to 10. And then in the first year, we do what? Again, we subtract the salvage value. We have our depreciable base. This is a different asset now. 11,000 minus the salvage value of 1,000 gives me a depreciable base of 10,000. And we take four tenths the first year, three tenths the second year, two tenths the third year, and one tenth the fourth year. And when we do that, bam, it's completely depreciated. I mean, whoever thought of this had way too much time on their hands, right? I'm sure they went to the club after this and they said, did you know if you add up the digits and you take four tenths the first year? And nobody would talk to them, right? Okay. But here it is. This is the way some of your digits works. Okay. So what if I asked you, what is the carrying value of this asset at the end of year two? What would be the answer? Huh? Good. Good. What'd you say, um, Nick? Four thousand. It's the eleven thousand minus what? Minus the seven thousand. I ask you that because giving me six thousand as an answer is an easy mistake to make, right? So you made it, so you won't make it again. You made it once, so you won't make it again. Okay. Okay. Good. All right. Now you come over. These depreciation things, guys, piece of cake. That's why I roared through them. Easy, easy stuff, right? Okay. Now, there's also this idea of depletion. What happens here? Well, now we buy a piece of land, not because of what we think we can put on top of it, but what we think is underneath the land. We want to get some mineral out of there or something, right? And so as we take the amounts out of that, the you know tons of gravel or whatever it is, out of the land, we're going to have to recognize the depletion cost. So we're taking this gravel out of the land. Why do people take gravel out of the land? What do they do with the gravel? Huh? Yeah, but if we're the person that's taking the gravel out of the land, we're trying to sell it to the people that are going to use it to build stuff, right? Okay, so we're taking the gravel out of the land, and then we're going to sell it. So when we first take it out, it's inventory, isn't it? And when we sell inventory, what does the inventory become? cost of goods sold. Okay, good. Okay. Now, we have to figure out what is our depletion base, and we're going to get to that in a second. And then once we know 
what our depletion base is, we will then divide that by the estimated recoverable units. What does that mean? The number of tons of gravel or whatever we think we can take out of this. We're going to have to have an engineering estimate or something that will tell us what that amount is. Thank God we don't have to do that. Okay, we're the accountants. We wait for the engineers to give us that number, right? Okay. Okay, good. So what is the depletion base? Depletion base is the cost to purchase the property. Any development cost, what happens? We can't sit up on the top of the land with a vacuum cleaner and get that stuff out of there. We're going to have to build mining shafts and whatnot so people can go down there and take the stuff out, right? Okay, the kind of stuff that people sing about in West Virginia. Okay, my granddaddy did this, and I'm going to do it too, right? I'm like, okay, move into something else, guys. I mean, let's not bother going down there to get any more coal so that you can get black lung disease and die like your granddaddy did at 50 years old. How about we stop putting money into coal and start putting into some sort of renewable energy? How about that? And we'll all meet in heaven at 90 years old. No, they want to do it. They want to keep doing it because their granddaddy did it. I was in West Virginia. You go to the hotel and they're selling little coal trinkets, chickens. You know, who does this piece of coal look like? Ch like a chicken. And they paint a chicken on it. Okay, I mean, they just love, you don't have to eat it or anything, but they love their, uh, their coal, okay? Now, anyway, so we have to get the guys down there. Sometimes they get stuck down there, don't they? Okay, then what? Plus any estimated restoration costs. What happens here? The federal government comes down and tells the company, you got to fix the land after you're done tearing it up. You know that, right? Okay, and that's why I was in West Virginia, because there was a lot of coal companies that weren't doing that, and the federal agency, the Office of Surface Mining, that's responsible for making sure they clean it up, weren't doing a good job. So Congress asked us to go take a look at what they're doing, and their big problem was that after a company gets done destroying the land, they walk away from the whole thing, and they don't pay any fines or anything, so we want to know why aren't they paying the fines, and the Office of Surface Mining told us, well, we chased the bad guys out of the business, and I'm like, well, where does a coal miner go when you chase them out of the business? Does they start their acting career at that point? I mean, well, now what are they going to do? And so we kept digging, and what we found out it took us all the way till Tennessee to learn that the uh, laws were such that you can't pierce the corporate veil of the new company that they start up. So there was a provision in the law there that was protecting the coal industry, wasn't there? That law is still there. Okay, so we've got some problems with our laws that are set up in such a manner because we have to be careful because Virginia has seven electoral votes and you can't be elected president if you don't get those seven electoral votes. So everybody goes and kisses up to the coal industry. That's why Hill, part of the reason Hillary lost the election because she said we're going to put the coal industry out of business. <laughs> she should have said that. There went Virginia. Okay, all right, so what happens? You then would go ahead and subtract off any residual value of the land. After you're done fixing it up, if you can sell it to a condo developer, then that's going to come off that cost, okay? All right, so you go ahead then and you come up with this depletion rate per unit, okay? And when we sit here with the depletion rate per unit, we would take the original cost, just looking at this example, uh, the total cost is $4 million. We take the original cost plus the development cost plus restoration. Their restoration is zero, so they must know that the Office of Surface Mining doesn't do a very good job, right? Because they're figuring they're going to have to pay anything to restore this. Minus what? Minus the residual value. That gives me my depletable base, which is $4 million. I divide it by the estimated recoverable units. That gives me a dollar per unit is my cost as I take out each ton of dollar per ton as I take out each ton of gra uh, gravel. Okay. Now, if I were to take out 400,000, my total depletion for the period is 400,000, right? But we would have to figure out if some of that is cost of goods sold. So if we actually went ahead and did what? Sold 375,000 units at a dollar a piece, that would be $375,000 of cost of goods sold. The remaining 25,000 is still in inventory, isn't it? Okay. Question? Again, nothing too, too difficult here, okay? I say that as we come up on non-monetary transactions. Now, hear this. 
the stuff that I'm about to go through will constitute your free response question on your final. The stuff that I'm about to go through hello, will constitute the free response question on your exam. This is what I'm going to make you do. I'm going to give you a set of facts, and you're going to have to go through, and you're going to have to do a set of journal entries for a non-monetary transaction. Okay? Now, what do we mean by non-monetary transaction? Instead of acquiring equipment by paying cash for it, we're going to acquire the equipment by giving up another piece of equipment. Now, that piece of equipment that we give up could be different from the piece of equipment we had. So we give up a building for a fleet of cars, different types of assets, right? Or it could be what? A similar asset as to the one that we're giving up, fleet of cars for a fleet of cars, okay? Now, what we're going to see is that is going to typically parlay into a different treatment of any gains on that exchange. Okay, losses will always be taken as losses. Losses are always taken, aren't they, immediately? Okay, so it doesn't affect how you count for loss. It affects how you count for gains, okay? So we come over and we say that we will have transactions that will either have commercial substance or will lack commercial substance, okay? Now, how do we know if a transaction lacks commercial substance, or should say, how will we know if it has commercial substance? Look at that from that point, since that's what we're on on this slide. Okay, exchange has commercial substance if future cash flows will change as a result of the transaction. So, when you're looking at these, I'm either going to tell you that the cash flows will change as a result of the transaction, or I'm going to tell you that the transaction has commercial substance. Okay, now think about it for a minute. If I had a building and I exchange it for a fleet of cars, are the cash flows that are generated from a building versus a fleet of cars going to be substantially different? Yes, they are, right? Fleet of cars, much shorter period. Building, much longer period, right? So even though that's not the rule, you could also in the back of your mind say, well, if we're exchanging a dissimilar asset, then the transaction is going to have commercial substance, isn't it? But again, I'm telling you, I'm going to call out the rule. I'm either going to say that the transaction has commercial substance or cash flows will change significantly as a result. Then you'll know that that transaction has commercial substance. With me so far? Okay. Now, if the transaction has commercial substance, then we will recognize gains. Now, look. We always recognize losses, right? So we didn't really need to tell you losses here, but I didn't feel like editing out the losses part of it. But the key, the focus here is what? On the gains. Okay, so you'll recognize a gain, and it's a piece of cake. Gains are always recognized in transaction you have in commercial substance. And we have this Foxy company exchanged uh, used cars for a building that could possibly become Foxy's company storage space. Future cash flows will change significantly. Are we going to recognize the gain? And it was a dissimilar asset. But again, I'll either tell you that or I'll say that it has commercial substance. Okay. The book value of the cars is 40000 102000 original cost minus 62000 accumulated depreciation. And the cars had a fair value of forty five. And Foxy must pay 20000 cash as part of the exchange. Okay. So what's going to happen? We're going to go ahead and we're going to see the fair value of the cars is 45000 the book value of the cars is what? The um, original cost minus accumulated depreciation, or 40000 So I have a gain of 5000 right? Am I going to recognize that gain? Yes, I am, because this transaction has commercial substance, right? Cash flows will change significantly. So I have to recognize that gain. So when I recognize that gain, and guys, the way you would put together this journal entry is the way I'm going to number it for you. When I give you this on your exam, it's not going to be the same exact question, but when I'll give you one that will be very similar to this, I am going to expect you, if you were smart, you would put the journal entry together in the way I'm going to show you by numbering this. Okay? Number one, credit the cars for the original cost because you're getting rid of them, right? Number two, 
debit the accumulated depreciation for whatever the accumulated depreciation is because you got to get rid of that, don't you? Number three, go ahead and credit the cash for 20000 because they told you they had to pay cash, right? Number four, you should go ahead and book the gain, which you just calculated, didn't you? So you'd have to calculate the gain to get that. And then the last thing you should try to figure out is the debit to the new asset, and it's the what? Journal entry that makes this, it's the number that makes the journal entry balance, isn't it? Right? So you should be able to get this whole journal entry, or at least maybe you're just missing that last piece, and you can get almost full credit for that. Because unlike the CPA exam, I'm going to give you credit for the ones you get right. If you miss one, I won't give you credit for that, but I'll give you the credit for the rest of them. CPA exam marks the whole thing wrong if you get one number wrong. But I'm not as mean as the CPA exam, right? Okay. Now, now let me show you something. Write this down. Value. of new asset equals what's BV book value of assets given up and that's almost always the case guys I'm going to show you one minor exception to that I spoke the words as I said them. It is not a good practice to try to read my horrible writing. It is better to hear what I'm saying and write it down, which is value of new assets, of new asset equals book value of assets given up. Value of new asset equals book value of assets given up. Okay, good. What was the book value of the... Um, of the um, the cars before I got rid of them? 40,000. Oh, forgot one part. Plus gain. Sorry. Plus gain. Recognize. Plus gain recognized. That says plus gain recognized. Plus gain recognized. Got that? Okay, let's try that. What was the book value of the old cars? 40,000. 40, Good. I'll just write it here, I guess. What was the book value of the cash? 20,000. I mean, book value of the cash is the amount of the cash, right? What was the gain? 5,000. Is that what they brought the building on at? Okay, that rule will work almost every time with one minor exception I'm going to show you here in a couple minutes. Value of the new asset equals what? Book value of the assets given up plus any gain. Okay. Okay, good. Or minus any loss. Okay. Because notice down here what? There was a $2,000 loss because they sold the, um, the uh, cars. I shouldn't say they sold the cars. Had a fair value of 38000 And since the book value was 40000 that's a $2,000 loss. So we just changed the facts up a little bit here. Instead of the fair value being 45000 it was 38000 Okay. So notice you still uh, credit the cars, debit the accumulator depreciation, credit the cash for the amount of cash they had to pay. You're left with the building, and now you would take what? The 40000 plus 20,000, and now it's minus the loss, 2,000, and that gives me the 58,000. Okay, so plus the gain or what? If it's a loss, minus the loss. Okay, okay, good. Again, but you would number one, two, three, four, five with the building being the last piece. Okay, okay, good. Now, what happens if the transaction lacks commercial substance? If we have a transaction that lacks commercial substance, damn it. If we have a transaction that lacks commercial substance, damn it. What a piece of junk. 
Okay, and if we have a transaction that lacks commercial substance, and how do we know it lacks commercial substance? It projected cash flows after the exchange are not expected to change significantly. Now, again, the rule is what? I'll either tell you it lacks commercial substance or if it says cash flows will not change significantly, then it lacks commercial substance. But just sort of a thing to keep in the back of your mind is what? We're probably talking about similar assets. If I trade a what building for a building, the cash flows probably aren't going to change significantly. Okay, but the rule is what? Cash flows will change significantly. So don't memorize similar versus dissimilar because that's not how it works. It's got to change the cash flow significantly. Okay, but as a practical matter, that tends to be true. Okay, so what happens? Should I recognize losses? Always recognize losses, right? Okay, it's the gains that we have to consider. Now, if no boot is received, I will not take a gain. Okay, if there's no boot, I should say, um, uh, is received, then there's no gain. No boot received, no gain. Yeah. Boot is cash. Thank you. No cash received. Okay. No cash received. No gain. Okay. Now, if boot is paid, there's no gain. If the boot that is paid constitutes less than 25% of the total consideration that's been received. Okay. Now, how do I determine the percent of... Um, um, how do I determine the um, amount of the proportion that the boot constitutes of the total consideration? Okay, and when we have a lack of commercial substance and boot is received, and it's less than 25% of the total consideration received, a proportional amount of the gain is recognized. Okay, and that proportion is basically the ratio. Okay, turn it to highlighter, John. The ratio of the total boot received decide, divided by the total consideration received. And that's how I will come up with the percentage. Now, that's the less than 25% rule. If the boot received constitutes more than, um, uh, if boot is paid in the, in the there's more, it's less than 25%, no gain. If boot is 25% or more of the total consideration, then both sides, both parties will take the entire gain on that, okay? So let me go through that again because I think I chopped that up a little bit. Let's just review it. No boot is received, no gain, okay? If boot is paid and the boot that's paid constitutes less than 25% of the total consideration received, no gain, okay? If what? If boot is received and the boot that's received constitutes less than 25% of the total consideration, then you'll take a portion of the gain, and that portion of the gain is considered by the fraction that has what? The amount of cash boot received in the numerator, the amount of the cash received in the denominator, plus the value of whatever other piece of property you got in this transaction. Okay? And then if boot received is 25%, if the boot is 25% or more in total consideration, what? Both sides take the gain, okay? Now, you look at this and uh, you're reminded that what? That losses are always taken, aren't they? Always take the loss, okay? All right, good. So let's go ahead here and let's just take a look at a couple examples. And I think once you look at the examples, you'll be like, Oh, okay, that's not as bad as I thought it was. Because at first it sounds like, okay, this is blowing my head up here, okay? But what happens? I have a machine, and it is exchanged for a, another machine. Um, so I have a machine, and I do what? I give up the machine and $2,500 in exchange for machine B. Has Boop been received here? Boot is paid. I paid $2,500, so boot has not been received here, right? Okay. So if boot has not been received, am I um, going to take – if boot is paid, do I take a gain? No gain if what? Okay. 
So I come over, good. And so I come over and I take a look here and what happens. The gain, the carrying value of machine B is 10,000. Machine A's fair value is 12,000. Machine B's fair value is 14,5. They gave me that in this problem. On your exam, I may not give you the fair value of machine B, but it's a piece of cake. It's what? It's whatever the fair value of machine A was plus the cash that had to be paid. Okay, now I come over and I do what? A gain is not recognized because the transaction lacks commercial substance and boot is being paid here, isn't it? Okay, so since boot is being paid, I go ahead and I debit machine B for 12,005, credit machine A for 10, and credit the cash for 25. Now you say, well, how did I come up with the amount for the machine? Uh, B here, and it is what? Book value of the asset surrendered was the rule? Book value of asset surrendered? So we gave up what? Machine A, Mac A for what? Book value was 10000 And we gave up what? Cash that had a book value of 2500 Did the rule hold? 12500 is what we bring machine B on at. Okay, okay, good. Now you come over and you take a look at this next one and now boot is received. Well, if boot is received, we have to think about what? Boot is received, um, we're going to have what? No gain because boot is being received here. Okay, and it has to what? Constitute less than 25% because if we go over the 25% threshold, both take the gain, right? Okay. All right, good. So we come over here and we take a look and we have this gain. Again, it's the same asset, potential gain of 2,000. We get machine A in exchange for machine B and now we're receiving 2,500. Carrying value of machine B is 10,000. Machine A's fair value is... 12 machine B's fair value is 9,500. Again, I may not give that to you if machine A has a what? Has a fair value of 12, and you had to give me how much? 2,500 to get that on my hands, and you had to give me machine B. Machine B must be worth 9,500, right? Okay. Now you go ahead and you say, well, look. $2,500 is the cash, isn't it? And what? The total consideration received was the $2,500 plus the $9,500, which was machine B, which constitutes what? 21%. So since that constitutes 21%, I'm sitting here and I'm what? I'm under the 25, right? So now I'm going to go ahead and do what? Take a portion of that gain. Okay, so I go ahead, and since the total gain was 2,000, I can take 417 of that gain, can't I? Okay, so I go ahead and I do what? I take machine A off the books. I obviously debit the cash, don't I? Okay, I can credit that gain, and now you're saying, okay, John, I know this material said plug. There is no plugs. There are rarely plugs in accounting. I'm going to show you how they got that number. Okay. Now remember, we said it's the fair value of the asset surrendered. I mean, the, excuse me, the book value of the asset surrendered. Okay. So the book value of that machine was what? Ten thousand, wasn't it, machine A? But this is where you twist the rule a little bit. We turned some of that machine into cash, didn't we? So since we turned some of that machine into cash, the real book value that we surrendered on that was what? 7,500? Because we got some cash back on that. Okay. And then you go ahead and the rule was what? Add the gain. And when you add the gain, do we get that number? Okay. So if there's a situation where you've taken you've taken some cash, you can still use the rule, the book value of the assets given up, just subtract the cash. From the book value of the asset that you're giving up, because you per turn part of that asset into cash. Okay? All right. Um, let's take a look. I'll tell you what.
since we're already past the time here, um, let's just go ahead and save this last example for this section till next time. We'll go through this. You want me to save the recording, but I, did I hand out the attendance sheet? I did, right? Okay. And so we're going to go ahead and we will pick up the um, exam the slides from here after this example, and then we got to kill ourselves to get through the questions. Hang on, guys. So that means that I need you to really take a nice look at those questions that are already up on Canvas. So that gives us a little bit of leverage so next time we can go a little faster at those questions and still understand what's going on, okay? All right, guys, have a good weekend.